For the samurai, a sword was not merely a weapon, but an extension of their soul. I can't give you a name. I can offer you a purpose. And welcome back to That Works. Today we're joined with art scholar Ilya Alexiev to give us an inside look at the Japanese katana, not just any katana, the katana morning light that's used by Henry Golding, who plays Snake Eyes in the new G.I. Joe movie that is currently streaming right now. Right now? Right now, I think so. Now, uh, the movie has a lot of special features to which even we did not have access to. Specifically, for example, the name of the smith who made the katana that you see in the movie, or according to the plot. Now, when you're dealing with Japanese antiques, specifically katanas, it is very important to know the name of the smith as from the prefixes of the art name, you can trace their school, when they were operational, who taught them, and even the features that will be necessary to tell that sword apart if you by accident see it, let's say, at a garage sale, just by looking at the blade. Thank you to Paramount and thank you to Snake Eyes for sponsoring this video. Now, we're going to use the theme of the Snake Eyes Katana to begin and a little bit elaborate on a very important topic of why we love katanas, why they're valuable to study, and let's get into some details about what makes these swords so popular in pop culture. Now, traditionally, the Japanese sword would have been used by the samurai, correct? Almost correct. Uh, the Japanese sword is used only by the samurai starting with the Edo period and ending with uh, the late 19th century. Before the Edo period, pretty much before 1600, uh, we have what we call the Warring States period, uh, which is exactly feudal Japan with feudal warfare. And in feudal warfare, most of the combatants are not of noble birth, and Japanese swords at that time would have been made, uh, often enough, not made very well and handed out to low-ranking troops and collected back after the battle because, uh, as any feudal society goes, you don't want to arm too many peasants or too many scoundrels who rob you on the highway after the war. Now, with a little bit that I do understand, traditionally, the sword fights would have been very quick one or two moves and that's about it not like what we see in hollywood is that right that is about right throughout history and throughout geography that is not unique to japan either however in japan specifically we know a lot about the martial arts schools that developed during the edo period the peace period and those schools specifically train on the most cost-effective way of winning a duel after all, at the end of the Warring States period, there became a need for the samurai to codify the martial arts and show off in front of each other, uh, defending their honor. And the defense of that honor usually meant showing how cultured you are within your martial arts school as well. But doesn't that sound like the exact opposite that we see in the movie Snake Eyes? Well, yes and no. You see, in the movie, Tenji Tanagaki, a true artist of martial arts choreography, had a very uh, unique problem to movie making industry. And that is, he has to use the foundation of traditional martial arts as he knows them, and adapt them to the theatrical, grandiose flair of blockbuster industry. So he had to update it to modern imagination of what fight scenes and special ops actually look like and give it a James Bond big secret feel with car races and guns and swords and motorcycles. He had to incorporate all of that without at the same time trivializing the use of the sword at all. Now am I correct? You brought along with you a clip that shows the behind the scenes look at that exact challenge and what they had to do to get over it, right? Yes, indeed. And in the clip, you will see how strenuous it is to adapt your body to perform acrobatics and mar movie martial arts choreography. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at that clip now. <laughs> 
But we all know Snake Eyes as this absolute weapon. So I knew I had to step up my game. With Kenji Tanigaki, we did such an intensive training course. Many movies just have a sword fight. It's a gun fight. Car action. But this movie have everything. Kenji is a myth, a legend, a god. Money. When we shoot, we are on the same page. He's got years of knowledge of choreography and sword play, samurai stuff. That sword work is the best I've ever seen. Join us. What do I have to do? Let's find out. First week is hell week. Your body is literally going from zero to 60. All of the actors, they really breathe these characters through the training. Very intense, but super fun. It's kind of like learning how to dance, but you are bruised at the end. It was hard, but now I feel invincible. Through the training, we all realized a lot about ourselves. We could do every single thing that was thrown at us. It's pretty amazing, actually. Wow, that looked like some serious action-packed sequences. Now, in the movie, we see Snake Eyes handed the katana, and he accepts it with absolute reverence. Now, how accurate is that with Japanese society? Well, that part, as theatrical as it may look, is incredibly accurate. Uh, in Japanese culture, uh, any katana, any sword that's real, the means made the traditional way, is thought to be, in a way, a reflection of one of the founding ju uh, jewels or treasures of Japan, which are uh, jewel, mirror, and sword. Uh, and because of that, Every sword in Japan has a tremendous cultural value. Uh, if the original sword, the grass cutter sword, uh, that is stored in the temple and no one is allowed to see it, except for the imperial family, is the sun, every other sword that exists in Japan is sort of like the moon that reflects some truth, some sacredness of the original sword. And even that uh, sword is not quite original, in the sense that uh, the entire nation of Japan was supposed to have been founded of the blade of a sword. Uh, and we can actually look it up. Here I have uh, a book called the Kajiki. Uh, this is basically a compilation of the founding myths of Japan. The second half of the book deals with actual history, but the first half of the book from here to here are the founding myths. You can interpret them as the uh, Asian analog of Greek founding mythology. Now, in the first section, the book opens up with a story. Mind you, this is very archaic language. Uh, granting to them the father and mother of Japan, uh, Izanami and Izanagi, uh, a heavenly jeweled spear, they thus, the gods, d uh, deign to charge them. So the two deities standing upon the floating bridge of the heaven pushed down the jeweled spear and stirred with it, whereupon they had stirred the brine of the sea or the ocean, till it went curdle curdle, and drew the spear up the and drew the spear up. The brine that dripped down from the end of the spear was uh, piled up and became an island. This is the island of Onogoro. So the first island of Japan was the brine of the sea that dripped down back into the ocean from the spear. Well, why are we talking about a spear rather than a sword? You see, Japan has a very specific way of classifying bladed objects. And within the Japanese classification of blades, a spear is technically a sword. And because this is a compilation of founding myths, there are regional interpretations of the myths whereupon in some parts of Japan, it is not the spear but rather a sword that creates the first island of Japan from onto which the gods descend and procreate. So you see, the very idea of a sword uh, is already connected to divinity. The first sword, the first weapons were made by the gods and because they were made by the gods, they were given a creative potential, a creative potential unlike anything a human being can do. And yet they are also the ancestors, the weapons themselves, are the ancestors of the entire people of Japan. And thus, every reflection of those objects 
no matter how trivial the situation in which you encounter it, has to be within the context of reverence that the user or wielder or even the appreciator of the object has to impart on the situation. We're dealing with an ethic of making mundane things sacred. But that was a long time ago. Who was the first Japanese smith to create the Japanese sword as we know it today? Well, that is a brilliant and a very important question. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Well, the first person to be credited with forging a Japanese sword the way we imagine it or see it today uh, was Sanju Munichika, and he established the very basic foundation of what the Japanese sword is. Uh, he was born in 987 AD. That was a while ago. Yes, and he is quite a bit mythologized in uh, Japanese culture. He's the main protagonist of the play, no theater play, called Kokaji, or Blacksmith. Now, the story of making the first truly Japanese sword is once again deeply tied to Japanese Shinto mythology and the presence of the divine in the mundane world. So the story goes the following way. Uh, the emperor receives a dream that a sword has to be forged and has to be forged by Sanjo Munichika. So he sends an emissary to the blacksmith. Well, the blacksmith, upon hearing the message, uh, is reluctant to accept the commission. Uh, and the reason why he's reluctant to accept the commission because he thinks that he does not have helpers who are equal to him in skill. Mm, we know what that's like. Well, oh, I, I know exactly what that is like. <laughs> I'm gonna pat myself on the back here. Now, uh, so uh, the smith, after uh, uh, some thinking, goes to the shrine of Inari Okami. Inari Okami is the Shinto goddess of industry and harvest and uh, industriousness. She's also the patron saint of blacksmiths. Upon going to the shrine, he meets a young man or a boy who for some reason is already aware of the top secret commission and implores the smith to accept it, saying that by the time he prepares for the forging and does all the proper ceremonies, uh, he will have a helper who is his equal. Mm. Now he's in for a surprise right there. Because once uh, he comes back and tells the emissary that, uh, yes, indeed, I will accept the commission, uh, but at the same time, I have some reservations. Uh, he performs the rituals, and remember, a uh, Japanese smith is also a Shinto priest within the domicile of the forge. Mm. Inari Okami herself shows up at the forge and assists him making the first truly Japanese sword and leaves. Now, this specific uh, story has tremendous cultural and religious significance. Uh, it has significance uh, in the way where we are given an insight into the role of the smith and the meaning of a lot of the rituals associated with forging of the sword. Uh, the sword can be seen uh, within a cultural context uh, as a living being uh, that is produced as a result of a union, a fertile union, between a female goddess and a blacksmith. That is precisely why uh, very, very old school swordsmiths uh, tend to not allow women in the forge. And that is not because women are bad, but because in the forge, the only wife a smith can have is the goddess herself. Mm -hmm. And you do not upset the goddess by making her jealous. Otherwise, she will leave the shrine of the smith and bad luck will follow him from there on. Oh, I always wondered about why they were so weird about having women in the forge. That's very interesting. Uh, there are interpretations where uh, since, let's say, uh, 1600, there have been uh, several female smiths and there are ritual roundabout ways of going around the canon. However, uh, the importance of the story already establishes the uh, 
sort as kind of a demigod in the sense uh, how Hercules was a demigod as a re result of a union of a mortal being and the divine. So the sword is always the result of a creative union between the goddess and the mortal man. So thus the reverence is recapitulated in the mythology and the and reestablishes itself as a maxim or a law to be followed. Every time you pick up a Japanese sword, you have to bow to the sword like this and to every single person who preserved it so that it will be handed to you. So hold up, you're telling me there's already a thousand year old story of sword play and swords in traditional Japanese theater? Yes. So that means that there's already a foundation of sword play in movies. Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. There's a long-standing history in traditional Japanese theater, especially starting with the Edo period, of theatralizing and making sword fighting uh, digestible by the general audience. Uh, and not only in no theater, uh, there's also kabuki theater, as well as in Shinto religious rites. Shinto religious rites, just like any religious rituals, are highly theatrical performances, and you can all often see Shinto priests uh, chasing away evil spirits using swords or arrows and what have you. Now, you can imagine that the choreography that Kenji Tanagaki establishes in Snake Eyes is merely the end of 20th, beginning of the 21st century, reincarnation or reinterpretation of the idea of martial arts created and interpreted for theatrical consumption. But, but why is it that the Japanese katana is so popularized in movies, video games, comic books, whatever? Why is it that it captures us so much? Well, because it's supposed to. Uh, the reason being is, and this is not a cop-out, Unlike most other swords throughout history and throughout the entire planet, the katana uniquely represents values of the upper class which are supposed to be eternal, that are supposed to impress people generations throughout. And those values and the fact that the katana is supposed to have them uh, are why there's an extensive appraisal, extensive art tradition of looking at the blade itself as a complete, unique work of high art. You see, the blade itself is already treated like a complete work of art designed to be appreciated and valued for its own sake. The vast majority of people who would have commissioned a personal sword for themselves would have belonged to the literati class, the highly educated individuals. And that is also signified by katanas on the tang having an inscription, who made it, for whom, and what the sword is dedicated to. The way you appreciate the Japanese sword is not the way you would appreciate a kitchen knife, not the way you would appreciate an axe, not the way you would appreciate an executioner sword. The way you appreciate a Japanese sword is the way you would as if it were an ink painting, a wall hanging scroll, a piece of calligraphy. The style, the mood, the dedication, the ethic of the smith are forever frozen in the steel. The way they replicate the best their school can offer is visible to the educated eye. And if you're good enough at appreciating Japanese swords, you can date a sword to the decade it was made, definitely to the school and even the location in Japan, just by looking at about one square inch of material. What also is important is that the Japanese sword, because of the way it is being approached by the literati class, is a conveyor of spiritual and ethical values just by its mere presence. 
Already in about uh, 11th, 12th century, you have images of samurai appreciating the polish of the Japanese sword, and the polish on Japanese swords is very specific. It, instead of covering up the problems that might be in the sword, are supposed to reveal all the features, all the sincerity of the work the craftsman put into them. Now, at the same time, we're dealing with a tradition that is deeply steeped in Buddhism, deeply steeped in Shintoism, and when we're dealing with the uh, and when we're dealing with the literati class, Confucianism. All three, in the classical uh, philosophy of morals, technically are virtue ethical theories. That means that the primary modus of appreciation of something as being good is whether a virtuous character would have done so. So what is being sought are not consequences of action, that is not the efficiency. Uh, what is being sought is not something that is good as in good in itself or whether it operates or in accord with the categorical imperative. No. What is being sought is whether something is virtuous, contains within it a type of character that we would admire. And the sword itself communicates traditional Chinese and Japanese virtue ethics, uh, Chinese via Confucianism and Japanese via Zen Buddhism and Shintoism values. The sword is revealing of the character of the smith and the person who is capable of understanding it. To contrast this, let's look at Europe in the 15th, 16th century for just a little bit. In the most prolific artistically period of European history, the uh, Italian Renaissance, uh, the most famous moral thinker, the one who would write for the princes and generals, was uh, actually Machiavelli, and that name is associated with us uh, with something like uh, a early version of utilitarianism where it is the outcome of an action that is the most important. And that's why people uh, in the West uh, over here tend to look at swords as the best sword is the one that cuts the most or lasts the longest, the one that's more efficient. Well, you don't need a sword as a result, to have an efficient action. So the sword is not important in the West because any sword will do so long as it satisfies these criteria. In Japan, we're dealing with virtue ethics and that's why not every sword will do, only a specific sword will do because only a specific sword embodies a set of values that the owner of the sword wants to advance in the future, that the owner of the sword wants to permanently attach to the family name for centuries onward. Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying the Japanese sword is so great not because it can cut through three bodies at one time, but because it can express traditional Japanese values onto anyone who sees it? That is about right, or at least half right. Uh, in reality, when we're talking about swords, uh, a sufficiently hard enough piece of steel that is very well sharpened will cut just as well as any other equally hard and equally sharpened piece of steel. Okay. Right? Uh, however, sharpened rulers don't really capture our imagination, although you can make a ruler that is sharp enough to win any map cutting competition. Hmm. Interesting. But what captures our imagination is something that the artists of old and even now successfully captured, uh, imprinted and solidified within steel. No katana is actually real katana unless it's made from traditional material, tamahagane. Uh, the reason for making it from traditional material, besides legal ones in Japan, is that because every katana is supposed to be a reflection in the mirror of the original sacred sword, to a certain extent, and is supposed to carry eternal values. And the only way you can carry eternal values is by practicing the way that you are certain of. And 
culturally and artistically, uh, the Japanese are very certain of the way they've been making swords as an expression of their own identity. Also, we have to consider that it's extremely hard to make a good or beautiful or valuable or righteous or virtuous Japanese sword from traditional materials. It is relatively easy to make a sword from traditional materials, but it will be like uh, me or someone else taking oil paints and saying, I painted a Rembrandt. No, it's extremely hard to paint just like Rembrandt with his coquettishness, with his character, uh, the way he sculpts the paint on the canvas, and the same way about Japanese sword is true. The same thing is true. Uh, what happens is the more you study it, the more you reveal how inadequate you are at studying it. That's interesting. And hence it commands, even without the religious, spiritual aspect, once you understand it as a work of art, it already commands respect in the way uh, a good musical piece by Bach commands respect, the Goldberg Variations. They might appear boring or trivial to the untrained ear, but since you studied music, you understand their complexity. So, a nice katana that you can buy uh, from Japan is more like buying the actual Goldberg Variations by Bach than it is like buying a knife at a hunting store. So there's a lot of katanas that exist in the world, but in your opinion, can a true katana be made by somebody who's not Japanese, somebody who's not in Japan? Well, the answer to that is a definite yes and no. Mm. So if we look at the katana as a curved, two-handed saber that's a little bit on the short side compared to modern age human height uh, that cuts things, yes, sure, why not? Anyone can make that kind of object, but is it really a katana? A more difficult interpretation of that is, theoretically, any person can go to Japan, study for five years plus three years of their own practice, uh, after having a license from the Ministry of Culture and NBTHK and be recognized as a sword artist and then every katana they make when they use traditional methods is a real katana. However, there is a problem with this. Uh oh. Indeed. You see, because the primary function of the katana is to communicate cultural ethical and religious values because the entire nation of Japan mythologically started from the foam that dripped from the tip of the blade into the sea because Japanese swords are reflections of the original treasure uh, that is in the temple it is only those swords that are made on Japanese soil that is, the soil that descended from the sword, by the uh, descendants of the original gods, the Japanese people, that, and that carry traditional Japanese values within the craftsmanship that are real katanas. Uh, it, there's a circularity, a beautiful cir circularity to this exclusionary philosophy, in that the Japanese sword was granted uh, to mortals by Japanese gods and those gods are attached to Japanese soil and Japanese ancestors and therefore only the people who are participating in that tradition both genetically and culturally are capable of replicating all those values in one object. And I suspect that's what Yoshinda Yoshihara says when he says a true Japanese sword can only be made in Japan. Now, who's Yoshinda Yoshihara? Yoshinda Yoshihara is perhaps the most famous uh, Japanese swordsmith outside of Japan. Uh, he is the grandson of Kunye Yoshihara, who started uh, becoming a swordsmith around the Second World War. 
And right now, Yoshinori Yoshihara is considered mukansa, meaning an artist without competition, and I believe one of the living national treasures. So, as far as his status as a sword artist, he's kind of the equivalent of uh, either Salvador Dali, Picasso, Rembrandt, El Greco, so on and so forth. He, uh, the buck stops with him, so to speak. Um, another artist who is way more conservative than Yushin Yoshihara is Gassan Sadatoshi, who is also a living national treasure. And he too, I believe, holds it true that uh, true katanas can only be made on Japanese soil. Precisely because they're supposed to communicate the values of that soil, the history that it has. I see. Now that we've dealt with some of the cultural context around understanding the Japanese sword, the katana, or Yari, Tachi, Naginata, they're all the Japanese sword. Let's briefly cover how one is actually made. Uh, before even beginning to make a real serious Japanese sword, uh, the smith, who in the act of making the sword is also a Shinto priest, has to follow a series of fasting ceremonies. Uh, for example, he would not eat meat. Uh, the reason for that being is the old Buddhist addendum that you cannot enjoy the death of another before creating something new, and it is thought of as part of the self-purification ceremony. After all, uh, your consort is the goddess herself, so you have to be at your utmost before engaging in creative activities. Uh, the priest, uh, or the smith, uh, prays to the shrine that is located uh, in the corner on the wall of the forge. He takes up uh, a piece of iron and hammers it until it's red hot and lights a piece of bark or paper. And using that flame, he lights the forge. Therefore, the flame itself is already a sacred flame. Then he takes pieces of bloomery steel or tamahagane in the case of Japan and sorts them out by examining them visually. He heats the pieces up in the forge, flattens them out, which redistributes the grain inside the material and makes them more solid and quenches them. After quenching, he breaks the pieces in order to further ensure how much carbon or how clean the material is. Pieces that break cleanly are considered a high carbon and go into one billet, and pieces that bend or are a little bit rough go into the low carbon billet. The high carbon billet is supposed to compose the jacket or the edge of the sword, and the lower carbon or medium carbon billet is supposed to go inside the sword. Now, there are two ways of thinking about it. One way is that having a soft core prevents uh, stress and cracks from traveling from the edge to the spine of the blade, therefore adding more durability to it. The other way is a little bit more scientific. Um, you see, traditional steels, not only in Japan, but also in Europe around the same time, were known as uh, shallow hardening steels. That is, when you try to heat treat them, it's only the parts that are exposed to the quenching medium that generally get hard, and the, your entire cross section becomes softer and softer and softer as you approach the center. Now, considering that only the skin of your sword will get hard and the core will remain soft anyway, it is fairly unreasonable to use highly refined high carbon steel for the parts that won't get hard anyway. So that is a practical explanation. Both can be true simultaneously. So after the pieces of Tamahagane are consolidated, broken up into tiles and sorted, now we start refining them. What we do, we take a Tekokane, which is a holding stick made out of previously used Tamahagane, to which a Tamahagane paddle is forge welded. The reason why the holding stick has to be made from Tamahagane or Oroshigane is because we don't want to contaminate our sword with modern or unclean materials. Now, after the paddle has been selected, 
Those tiles are carefully stacked, allowing, allowing for the least amount of gaps possible on the paddle and wrapped with rice paper, straw ash, and clay. The straw ash and the clay act together as flux, uh, similar to you see modern smith use borax. That wrapped billet is placed in the charcoal cover and the smith heats it up carefully watching the flame, watching the sparks that come out of it, and at the same time listening to how the air ignites the charcoal in the forge. Once the billet is hot enough, the smith pulls it out and either with a power hammer or with an assistant starts consolidating and fusing the tiles together. He further starts cutting it in various directions and folding it. What happens here is by extending the original tiles and folding them on themselves, he squeezes out the impurities, the slag or the flux from between them and at the same time using the phenomenon known as carbon diffusion homogenizes the distribution of carbon within the iron that is in the steel throughout the billet making it a rough equivalent in the end of modern steel. Uh, Nice katanas uh, from Tamahagani have almost identical features under the microscope to modern day 1075 steel. And that is a pretty, pretty good accomplishment for medieval technology. So a lot of times when we talk about katanas, I hear that these have a thousand or a million folds in the blade. Is that accurate? That is a misinterpretation of what's actually going on. Uh, usually, what people mean are the layer count and the blade. Now, the layer count by itself doesn't make a good blade. Uh, what makes a good blade is the level of refinement. Now, uh, in terms of numbers, imagine a paddle and tiny tiles are stacked on it, uh, let's say 20 tall, mm -hmm. right? And usually a katana has approximately uh, 12 to 15 folds total in it. So a fold divides uh, the billet by 2. So we have 2 to the power of 12, or 2 to the power of 15 times 20 or so. Oh, and so it truly is, when, they, when we hear those numbers, we're talking about how many layers, not necessarily how many folds. Correct. Okay. If you keep folding high carbon steel a million times, what will happen is, let's say each fold uh, takes approximately, uh, if you're really good, one minute, right? That means there are a million minutes where steel that is welding hot is exposed to the atmosphere. That also means that your billet, which is entirely combustible, remember iron or steel are highly combustible in the atmosphere. It's only because uh, they're tightly compact and the surface area is relatively low that this anvil doesn't catch on fire. However, as a grinder, you know those sparks, or if you ever had a camping uh, mm -hmm. iron and flint set, well, that's iron uh, ex uh, burning out in the oxygen. So you're burning your iron and you're burning the carbon, which is even more combustible. Mm. So as it travels out and, uh, and being eaten out by oxygen, there's less carbon here, but it also wants to travel out through diffusion because it wants to even out its uh, percentage compared within the billet and in the atmosphere. And as a result, you will end up from a billet this big after folding it a million times with a billet of iron this big huh. and it's something entirely useless not only for swords but for many other things so when society uh, makes a big deal about how many folds or how many layers are in the piece is that necessarily ever in the head of the actual Japanese smith are they ever counting their layers or are they literally stopping once they are done consolidating the material yes and no so Various Japanese schools have a accepted method and part of the method is you fold your high carbon steel 12 to 15 times and you fold your lower carbon steel 8 to 10 times and that's what the school does.
However, every craftsman experiments and at a certain level of uh, mastery, they try to replicate older styles and older styles would have used less folds. So that's when the game begins folding until you know you can stop and taking a gamble, see, uh, thinking how many mistakes you make. Because the more you fold, if you're good at folding, eventually you get rid of all the mistakes. Uh, but if you fold less, more of the mistakes are preserved in the material. So it, it is a yes and no. Is it a point of pride for a smith to fold less times? For some smiths, yes. For other smiths, uh, the point of pride is to carrying the best practices of the school forward throughout generation. Now that the high carbon billet and the medium or low carbon billet are fully refined, it's time to put them together. Uh, there are many ways a uh, Japanese sword is put together from those two materials. Uh, there is the Sanmai version where two, just like a kitchen knife, medium carbon or low carbon, medium carbon, low carbon, and inside here there's just a tiny sliver of high carbon steel. Uh, there's the Kabuza construction where you make a boat out of high carbon steel and inlay and forge well your low carbon steel. That is the most ubiquitous way Japanese swords are made. Then there are Gomai, Honsan Mai, so on and so forth. Constructions that are a little bit more complicated and at the same time they're a little bit late in the history of the Japanese sword and usually pertain to the Shinto and Shin Shinto uh, category. Once the billets are put together they're forged out into a sonobe or a bar which is about 90% of the length of the final piece. Uh, the rest of the length uh, is accomplished by carefully beveling the sword by hand. After the sword is beveled it is scraped and filed and more often than not uh, clay is applied to it. Now the function of the clay is to insulate the steel from the quenching medium, which with traditional Japanese swords is always water. The insulation produces the effect of differential cooling, meaning that the steel covered by the thicker layer of clay cools off slower and the steel that is covered by a very thin layer of clay cools off faster. Now the steel that cools off faster becomes extremely hard and the steel that cools off slower becomes either medium hard or soft. Now uh, this is where eye control and knowledge of your material comes in because it's not necessarily true that the steel that was not as well exposed to water is entirely soft. Uh, very often katanas in the parts that were protected by the clay exhibit bayonite structures. That is, it is a martensitic lattice that is trapped within the softer steel. And that steel uh, might appear to you as if it is soft, but I assure you it is quite not. And you can ask any horimono or engraving artist about how difficult it is to carve. It is not always the case that a uh, Japanese katana needs to be covered with clay to produce what is known as a hamon or edge pattern or differential hardening. Uh, what a very experienced smith can do is he can control the differences in which the thin edge and the thicker spine heat up in the fire by heating up the edge to critical and heating up the spine to just below critical and quenching the blade in water which will produce an ostentatious hamon. Uh, that hamon will almost always look like a uh, choji or clove blossoms with a lot of activity. The reason for that effect is because the bubbles that are formed around the hot blade by themselves end up acting as if they were clay being trapped in certain regions and insulating the spine from the water. Now this procedure requires an extreme amount of control and patience and not a lot of smiths do that. Well, after the blade has been quenched, uh, the smith trues it up a little bit because very often uh, blades warp this way or this way 
And the reason why the blades warp is because if over here there's a little bit more marked inside, the blade is effectively longer on this side, so it moves this way. Uh, there are various ways a smith can correct the shape of the blade after the blade has been quenched and um, anyone can look into them. Uh, however, I don't recommend anybody who is not experienced practicing them. After the blade has been in fact straightened, what usually is the case is that the smith sends the blade to the polisher. Now, the polisher can in fact be the worst enemy of a bladesmith. The reason is, if the job of the smith is to control the steel and create something new, the job of the polisher is to reveal the honesty of the object. So, if the smith uh, was a little bit rambunctious, lazy, or unskilled, the polisher will not be able to lie. And all the problems in the blade will be shown to the end consumer. Uh, the polisher, too, performs uh, an important cultural function because not even new blades need polishing, but antique ones as well. And the polisher, too, is a Shinto priest during his job. And polishing itself is an ablution or purification ceremony at the same time as uh, a restoration process or a completion process. The job of the Japanese polisher is exceedingly difficult and sophisticated to the point that uh, Western museums that exhibit traditional Japanese swords uh, don't often have a person on staff or in contacts who can actually regularly uh, keep up the objects. And more often than not, if you are a collector of Japanese swords, your best choice is to contact someone in Japan who is trained and has a license and engage in a very long uh, process with paperwork of sending your item to Japan to be polished and sent back. Well, now that we know how the Japanese katana blades are made, let's just take a second and pretend that I don't care at all about Japanese swords. I only like Western swords, European swords. Why? in your opinion, would it be important for me to study how these are made and why these are made? Yes, that is an absolutely excellent question. Uh, a question with which I myself struggled uh, and that is the question I posed before I became interested in katanas. If you are, let's say, a HEMA practitioner, you're interested in European swords and European martial arts. Mm -hmm. The problem is most of the swords you hold are made from modern materials using modern methods and you're using it in a completely modern context. Okay. So what you're doing is in a sense unlearning the European sword rather than studying it. For the vast majority of history, European swords have been made the exact way Japanese swords were made. High carbon steel, low carbon steel, put the core in, except double edge, and in some Japanese swords it's double edge. Uh, bloomery steel that is shallow hardening, so on and so on. The materials were almost identical, hmm, right? Except with the Japanese tradition, it is unbroken. You ask any Japanese smith, and they can name the names of their teachers 800 years back. Hmm. Right? The guy who was taught by this guy was alive and taught by this guy, so on and so forth. Right? It's not the case with the European swords. And, as I mentioned before, a very complex system of appraising and authentication has developed because of the unique history of the Japanese sword. Now, that is completely absent from European sword scholarship and uh, collector circles. Really? Well, indeed. Most of the time, uh, HEMA uh, or even collectors of European swords identify this sword to the centuries by looking at what does the cross guard look like? How wide is the blade? How long the handle? They look at the picture of the sword rather than the sword itself. Now, you know for a fact that it's not very difficult to take a uh, 15th century sword, narrow it down a little bit, pull off the guard, because those guards would have been purchased by the barrel, right. by the cutlers, 
put a new guard on there, threw it up, and now all of a sudden you have a 16th or 17th century sword, even though all the parts, the, the blade was made in the 16th century. It's not very difficult, in such cases actually fairly common. One of such cases is uh, the famous Tizona in Spain, that is uh, supposedly a uh, 12th or 11th century sword, but it's mounted in the 15th century style, right? right. Uh, and what I'm proposing is, if you study the way Japanese swords are appraised, the skills of appreciating the steel and being able to date and locate a specific object by just looking at one square inch of polished steel to a village and to the decade can be done on European swords if we transfer the authentication, appraising and polishing techniques to our own Western weapons. Now, the other thing is, if you're a European martial artist, uh, you usually practice with spring steel swords, and spring steel didn't actually exist up until the 18th century. Some will say that the crucible steel uh, of the 16th century was spring steel. Well, if we look at the crossbows manufactured during that time and how thick the bow arms are, they did not have spring steel because they could not consistently produce it, mm. and that's why the pull distance is about three inches on those thick crossbow arms because even they were a little bit soft on the inside and the outside was a little bit too hard. That is, the crossbow arms made from the same steel have a hamon, so to speak. Uh, so what you're dealing with is a European sword that in reality would have operated almost the exact way as a katana does. That is, it would have had a softer core or a softer center and harder edges. Meaning, uh, you have to adjust, if you're a scholar of martial arts, your body dynamic to something that is closer to a katana and prefer a more austere interpretation of fighting manuals. Uh, than the extravagant, high-paced interpretation that you see in tournaments. You have to favor the interpretation of a duel where if you don't win in two or three moves, that's it. Because simply enough, your sword physically would not be able to survive your body dynamics that you learned from practicing with modern materials. Interesting. So, it is not that I'm a fan of the katana, which I am as a work of art. I'm also a fan of the katana as an amazing natural experiment in preserving sword technology. We learn more about European swords from studying katanas than we learn about European swords from studying European swords. It is counterintuitive. But once you realize exactly what's going on in the process of making a katana that has been unchanged, it is unchanged by Japanese law. You will realize that we have a nice time capsule that gives us insight into our own history, into Mongol sabers, into uh, Viking swords, uh, and there are pictures of Viking swords and saxes that have a hamon because they were sent to a Japanese polisher, uh, into crusader swords. Uh, there's the wealth of information a katana reveals because of what it is and because of how it historically developed and was preserved about Europe is so immeasurable that it is almost a sin not to study it precisely because you're interested in European swords. Yeah, that time capsule point is, is very, very valuable. I don't think people think about that often if ever and a lot of times in pop culture we see people trying to put the western european swords up against the katana and it's like they pick a side and they're very stubborn but in reality if we drop the veil study everything that we have especially this it, we're going to learn about everything so that is that is just an amazing point that it is it is, in fact, the tragedy when something becomes popular, that the more popular an object becomes, the more misunderstood it becomes. Uh, this tragedy is especially apropos of the katana because it's supposed to communicate values that are not understandable to all. 
<laughs> so the more people know about it, the least they understand it. Sure. But at the same time, the more popular the European sword becomes, the more cultish prejudice is formed around it that makes people not understand the innate connection craftsmen of excellence have no matter the timeline and no matter their region. There are only so many ways you can refine bloomery steel and even fewer ways of refining it well. Well, Mr. Alexiev, thank you so much for being here today and every day that you're always here. I thought this would just be a quick video on an inside look at Snake Eyes and his sword Morning Light. However, this has turned into a much, much more in-depth conversation about the Japanese katana. Be sure to check the link in the description below to check out Snake Eyes on Digital Today. Thanks so much once again, Ilya Alexa, for being here. And we will catch you guys next time. And thanks for watching this special edition inside look at the Japanese katana. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. That's right, pound that like button and tell us in the comments below what build you'd like to see this team build next. And please consider subscribing to this channel. That works. Thank you.